morning, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and such a lovely privilege to have Gillian Wellness Perry with us. We've been talking about it for a while, but we did particularly plan to host this event um, as close to what would have been Anna Frank's 92nd birthday. She was born on the 12th of June, 1929. And so this coming Saturday would have been her birthday. And so in the month of June, we wanted to, to have this particular webinar. So thank you so much, Gillian, for agreeing. And on behalf of the three centers in South Africa, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation, my colleagues, Tally Nates from the Johannesburg Center, Heather Blumenthal from the uh, Cape Town Center, and we wish your husband a speedy recovery. Uh, Heather's husband is sadly in hospital at the moment, and our thoughts are with him and with your family. Um, we are also delighted to welcome Myra Osrin, the founder of the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center, and Myra, who has had a wonderful and long special friendship with Gillian, will introduce her more formally after my words of welcome. Um, we are also thrilled to have such a global audience, and I know that people are still trickling in, and we've had a wonderful response. And I've also had some frantic calls later this afternoon from people who have suddenly been made aware of load shedding. For those of you who don't live in South Africa, possibly become aware through these webinars that we have power outages from time to time in an attempt to preserve electricity. And uh, this is just one of those times that it's just so inconvenient and unsuitable, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. And we are um, sorry that those people who haven't been able to join but delighted to tell you that there is a recording which we will distribute to everybody who did register. So those people who have registered um, and have not been able to join this evening, do not despair. Um, uh, you will receive the recording. It isn't quite the same as this wonderful live opportunity, but better than nothing for sure. Um, we are delighted also to welcome many, many friends, Holocaust survivors, teachers from around the globe, Thank you all so much. Anna Frank is one of those uh, special icons of the Holocaust and a, a story that interestingly appeals to young people. And as Claudia was explaining, in Durban, from an education perspective, the education grapevine is very much aware that the Durban Holocaust and Genocide Center have this unique space in our exhibition. And most of them now read Anne Frank's uh, diary in the um, English classes for young uh, learners. But it's a tough uh, diary to read because are used to happy endings. And so it's a very important uh, diary that they read. And many of them found the visit to our center. With the Anne Frank House. And that was also an introduction by Myra to the head of the International Department of the Anna Frank House at the time, Jan Eric Dubelman, and uh, Aaron Peterer. Special evening. One last announcement that I would just like to make uh, that is particularly poignant for us in Durban is that when we were creating our exhibition, um, we were looking for somebody who would be that creative construction person who would be able to physically reproduce the images and the spaces to, to, to poignantly reflect this history. And through a great deal of research, I stumbled on a man who had recently at the time retired from the performing arts. He had run the, uh, managed and created all the props for NAPAC in Durban at the time. He'd recently retired and he came on board and took such personal pride his name was Michael Jackson, and the reason I'm mentioning him is that Mike passed away last week, very suddenly, and I do want to just mention him and his love for his absolute uh, exceptional handiwork in the creation of this Anne Frank reproduction. It's something that will, is very dear to us, and so Mike is certainly um, missed, but certainly not forgotten. So thank you for, for that moment um, to pay tribute to him and to welcome you all once again. Thank you so much for joining us. And if I could ask Myra Osrin, the founder of the Cape Town Center to formally introduce Gillian. Thank you, Mary, for this opportunity to introduce the guest speaker for this evening's webinar, Gillian Wallace-Perry. 
it is indeed a very special pleasure to be doing so, not only because Gillian is a close colleague and personal friend of almost 30 years, but perhaps more significantly, albeit that we did not know this when we first met in 1992, that our meeting then would play a key role in the future establishment of a Holocaust Center in Cape Town and the subsequent later development of centers, both in Johannesburg and Durban. But allow me to return to that story a little later. Gillian was the co-founder in 1990 of the Anne Frank Educational Trust in the UK, starting it off as a one person operation from her home. Serving as its executive director for 26 years, when she retired, the trust then had a team of 35 people educating over 40,000 young people every year. Under her directorship, the reach and caliber programs conducted by the trust were trailblazing. Amongst these, Gillian oversaw the staging of over 200 public exhibitions and was responsible for the introduction of a National Anne Frank Day in the UK and the Anne Frank Declaration, which was signed by world leaders and major celebrities. And in 2010, she was awarded an MBE in recognition of her work in education. Since her retirement, she has been in great demand as a lecturer on the life and legacy of Anne Frank, as well as a range of popular social history topics. She also acts as an ambassador and advisor to the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect in the United States. But back now to 1992, while serving as the chairman of the Cape Town Holocaust Memorial Council, I first met Gillian whilst on a visit to London. She told me then about the extraordinary and Frank in the World International Travelling Exhibition. And in discussion, we both felt that the timing for a national tour to South Africa of such an exhibition was perfect. Nelson Mandela had been released a few days before, years before, apartheid had been dismantled, and South Africa's first democratic elections were just a few years away. Gillian immediately set up a meeting for me in Amsterdam with young Eric Dribbelman, the brilliant international director of the Anne Frank House. And a few days later, I returned home to Cape Town as the newly appointed national director of the forthcoming Anne Frank of the World Exhibition Tour of South Africa. And as they say, the rest is history. The national tour was officially opened in Cape Town in April 1994. Jan Eric coming to Cape Town to assist in the installation of the exhibition and to train our voluntary guides. And in May, a few weeks after South Africa's first democratic election, Gillian was the guest speak, speaker along with Robin Mabeki and Helen Sussman at the opening of the exhibition in Port Elizabeth. At the end of 1995, with a hugely, after a hugely successful 18-month tour of eight cities throughout South Africa, the exhibition left our shores. But the seeds had been sown. The huge impact that the story of Anne Frank and the important human rights lessons of the Holocaust had made on the general public and more particularly on educators was to lead within a very few short years to the establishment of a permanent center for Holocaust commemoration and education in Cape Town in 1999. And so it is with so much pleasure that I hand over now to Gillian, who will speak, and I see the title is Anne Frank and her surprising global legacy. Uh, and of course, I'm sure it's uh, a great deal about her must read book advert, plugging your book, Gillian but it really is a must read book, uh, The Legacy of Anne Frank, which tells of the influence that Anne's diary has had on people all over the world over the past 70 years and the inspiration it has brought to millions. So with pleasure, Gillian, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Myra. And before I say anything, I'm getting, I don't know how I'm going to give this talk because I'm quite emotional now. Um, because you personally have had such a huge influence on my life. 
And it's one of the great privileges of my life to have spent so much time with you and Elliot. And um, I, I'm getting also emotional seeing so many uh, uh, old friends who are cropping up on this, on this meeting. And um, it's like a sort of history of my life. But um, what I'm gonna do without any further ado, I'm going to do the tech stuff and share the screen. And um, thank you so much for those lovely words. I'm just <laughs> I'm completely welled up, but there we go. Let's um, get up with the tech stuff. And there we are. I hope uh, everybody can see a blue background and uh, a lovely picture of Anne Frank on the screen. And so um, I'm going to uh, talk to you firstly about Anne's life, uh, and then I'm going to hope that you've all got your suitcases with you because I'm taking you off on a little whistle stop tour of the world. And I think you'll appreciate it because I understand in South Africa, uh, you're in the depths of winter, uh, a dark evening, and it's, it, it, the weather's not particularly good. So um, I even will bring you over to London where I'm sorry to have to tell you the weather is absolutely gorgeous. And I think Mary planned her visit accordingly because she's uh, sitting in the sunshine in London at the moment. Um, now, um, Mary mentioned Anne Frank being an icon. Of course she is. But what I want to do with you tonight is really flesh her out and make her into a real human being for you and uh, tell you really where she's come from. And you will actually feel that perhaps you've got to know her a little bit. I've seen that many of you have actually visited the Anne Frank house. That's wonderful to hear. And I hope that those of you who haven't already, uh, when conditions allow, this is going to encourage you to pay a visit to Amsterdam and maybe hop over to London at the same time. So without further ado, let's get going. And I can't talk about Anne Frank without telling you something about this man, because I always say that he is actually the reason I'm sitting before you um, today. And this is, of course, Otto Frank, Anne's father. Uh, as he is our inspirational figure in this story. And as the story moves on, you will understand more about why. So here you see Otto Frank as a young man on the left with his two daughters, Margot on the left and little Anne on the right. And here you see Otto as an older man after the war. Otto was actually born in Frankfurt in 1889, the same year as Adolf Hitler actually. Otto was born into a uh, Jewish family who'd actually come out of the Frankfurt Jewish ghetto uh, the previous century, towards the end of the uh, 18th century. And by the time that Otto was born in the late 19th century, the family was so well established uh, in Frankfurt society that Otto's father, Michael Frank, didn't just work in a bank. He actually owned a bank, the Michael Frank Investment Bank. So this was the Frankfurt uh, society that Otto was born into, along with his two brothers and sister. Uh, now, uh, the bank was actually very highly regarded and even Kaiser Wilhelm was one of its customers. So you can see the, the circle that Otto was moving in. Now, as a young man, Otto went off to study business in at Heidelberg University. And there he actually met a young American man called Nathan Strauss, and that's Nathan on the right. Now, Nathan and Otto became friendly, and Nathan invited his new friend Otto to sail across to New York and come and do some work in his family's business. Now, Nathan's father owned a department store in New York, which you may well have heard of. It was Macy's. Uh, Nathan's father owned Macy's store. And so there you go, young Otto sails across from Europe, uh, sails into New York, the Statue of Liberty, these beautiful skyscrapers. So you can imagine the excitement. And Otto really fell in love with America and New York um, and possibly would have remained and stayed an American citizen. Now, the photograph that you see on the right, I actually took myself because as um, Myra mentioned, I do a lot of work with the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect in New York. And every time in New York, I go to Macy's, by the way, I'm wearing 
something from Macy's tonight, especially. But I always make a point of going in through that doorway because that's the original doorway that Otto would have sort of marched in as a young man with all the world in front of him um, to do his work experience. And so uh, he, he probably, as I say, would have stayed in America had not in 1909, his father died very suddenly. And Otto was called back, obviously he went back to Europe to attend the family funeral of his father. He came back to New York for a short while, but then he was called on by his family to go back to Frankfurt and take over the running of the family bank. Now, Otto was not really a born banker. It wasn't really in, in his psyche. He was more a, a successful small businessman. This is what he enjoyed doing. But nonetheless, he felt the family duty to go back and help out with the family bank, which he did until in 1914, of course, his life changed. Uh, Otto was called up to fight in the First World War. Now, he fought very patriotically and for his country, Germany, and he fought very valiantly, so much so that by the end of World War I, Otto Frank had received the Iron Cross for valour and had been promoted to the rank of lieutenant, neither of which helped him 20 years further on. By the mid-1920s in the post-war economic crisis in Germany, the family bank was not doing very well, as you can imagine. Nonetheless, the Frank family still had a very good reputation in Frankfurt society. And he met uh, a young woman called Edith Hollander, whose family, as you can probably guess from her name, had um, Dutch roots. Uh, they actually fell in love and married within two months of meeting. She was the daughter of an industrialist, a wealthy industrialist from Aachen in Germany. And despite the fact that the Frank family uh, didn't quite have the wealth that they had previously enjoyed, uh, the family's name was still very highly regarded. So uh, Edith's father was more concerned about the fact that Otto wasn't really very religious uh, than the fact that um, he didn't have quite as much money anymore. So they had a lovely society wedding and went off to San Remo in Italy for a delightful honeymoon. The following year, um, in February 1926, their first daughter, Margot Betty, was born. You can see on the left a gorgeous little dark haired, dark eyed girl. And then three years later, uh, around the time, the, the date that we're celebrating with this talk, 12th of June 1929, their second daughter, Annelise Marie, arrived. And her name was soon shortened to what we would say Anne, but they would uh, pronounce it in the continental way of Anna. Now, I particularly find this uh, photograph of Anne on the right rather poignant because there she is sleeping so innocently in her little bed quite oblivious and innocent on what life awaits for her. Now, this photograph was taken in March 1933, and uh, the family are on an outing to Frankfurt city centre. Um, you can see um, Edith sort of smiling into the camera, into Otto Frank's camera. Uh, on the right, you see Margot uh, looking a little stoic, but you can see little Anne on the left there scowling. Probably her father had taken one too many photographs of the family on that day. But actually, by the time this photograph was taken, their lives as Jews in Germany had changed. Because on the 30th of January, 1933, Adolf Hitler has been appointed Chancellor of Germany. And then on the 5th of March, uh, the Nazi party is elected into power. Uh, the Nazi party soon starts dismantling all forms of democracy, bringing about the Enabling Act, and anybody who opposes the regime is uh, imprisoned. And, um, and then, of course, measures against the Jews start to be incrementally brought in. By the summer of that year, Otto Frank feels that there is no future for his family in the country of his birth, the country that his family had lived in so successfully for many generations. So he starts making plans to um, leave Germany. Now, where to go? Well, he starts thinking about the neighboring country of the Netherlands and for various reasons. Uh, firstly, in World War I, the Netherlands had been 
neutral. And also it had a long history of tolerance of other religions. So after the expulsion of the Jews of Spain in the 15th and 16th centuries, many of the Jews from Spain found their way to Amsterdam and they helped build the city, the great trading city that it, it became in the 17th century. Also in the 18th century, the Netherlands was um, welcoming and tolerant of Catholics. And bearing in mind it was a Dutch Protestant country, that was quite unusual. Now, more pragmatically, Otto knew the city because he'd done business in the city previously. But also his brother-in-law in Switzerland worked for a German company called Opecta. Now, Opecta manufactured a product called pectin. And I have to tell you that when I give this talk to schools and I ask them if uh, the school kids, if they know what pectin is, I get a lot of sort of blank looks and shaking of the head. But uh, when I uh, speak to perhaps an older demographic and I ask them if they know what pectin is, I usually get a few sort of um, vigorous nods um, because pectin is a natural setting agent, agent for making jams. And this was a very pro popular thing to do in 1930s Netherlands. The Dutch liked to pick their fruit seasonally and bottle it and put it into preserves. So here was a real business opportunity because the Dutch liked to make their own jams. A little later on, he partnered up with another German Jewish refugee, Hermann van Pels, and they expanded the business into spices, uh, spices, importing spices for sausages, and the Dutch liked their sausages as well. So here you can see a good business opportunity. Now, um, by September 1933, and bear in mind, it's only really a matter of months since the Nazis have come into power, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Frank have moved to Amsterdam. And Otto has found them a place to rent, a lovely apartment on the Maveda Plain in the south of the city, number 37. And by the way, you can go and visit uh, that whole area where Anne grew up before she went into hiding. If you happen to be visiting Amsterdam, you can actually go on a tram down to this area and you can see a lot of places that are significant in Anne's story. So here you are um, at the time, this was a very modern building and possibly what attracted Otto to the Maveda Plain was perhaps the nearest thing to a New York skyscraper he could find in the city of Amsterdam at the time. Now the apartments were built in triangular uh, construction around a beautiful green area where the children would actually go and play and get to know each other. The statue of Anne, of course, wasn't there at the time. No one would know who she was, um, but it was put up fairly recently by the owner of a local bookstore just around the corner. More about the bookstore a bit later on. Uh, so uh, Mr. and Mrs. Frank arrive in September, December of that year. Margot comes on, brought by her grandmother uh, to Amsterdam. And then uh, later on in February of 1934, Anne arrives, brought by her grandmother as well, um, and the family is then complete. Now, um, Anne soon starts school. Uh, she starts in the nursery of the Montessori School, again, just around the corner. And um, it, Montessori education was quite a popular form of education for the German Jewish refugees. Uh, particularly, I think um, Mr. and Mrs. Frank thought it would be very suitable for their rather uh, chatty uh, little daughter uh, because there was a combination of the formality of lessons, um, a good basic education, but also creativity and informality when needed. Uh, they thought this was very suitable for Anne. Uh, if you look carefully in the picture, you'll see little Anne right in the center. She's ringed in, in, this, in the circle there. Now that is still a school, believe it or not. Um, it's uh, now known as, not surprisingly, the Anne Frank School. And again, if you go and visit the area, you can go and see the school where Anne attended. Uh, the uh, writing on the wall is not graffiti put there by an unruly school kid, but actually it's been put there deliberately because it replicates the writing in Anne's diary. Now, Anne was a very outgoing, popular, uh, gregarious little girl, and she loved making friends. 
Uh, so uh, here we can see some photographs of her. You'll probably recognize it's the Moveda plane, particularly from the skyscraper, the back of the right hand picture. When I talk to uh, younger children uh, in elementary and primary school, I sort of ask them to identify some of the toys because some of the toys that Anne was playing with very did. Uh, very similar to the toys that they still play with. I know that perhaps a hula hoop is more used in a gym now than in a toy box, but if you look at the uh, left-hand picture, you can see a scooter very similar to the scooter that my three-year-old grandson has just taken uh, delivery of his first one. Um, the little girl in on the left of the left-hand picture in the dark outfit is Anne's particularly good friend, Susanna Lederman. On the right hand picture, you can recognize Susanna in the middle and a little girl called um, Esther, I believe, or Esther, or Eva, Eva is the little girl on the left. Now, people often ask me, how come there are so many remarkable pictures of Anne Frank? Um, well, the thing is that Otto Frank was a very keen photographer. And in the 1920s, he bought himself a Leica, very good German camera, and his twin passions became photography and photographing his two little girls. And if you look at the bottom right hand corner of the right hand picture, you can just see the shadow of Mr. Frank's head. Other people have asked me uh, in the past, how come these photos survived after they went into hiding after they were arrested? Well, before the family went into hiding, Otto sent a big box of the photographs to his family in Switzerland to look after. And of course, after the war, those were, in, were retrieved. And it's that incredible collection of photographs, certainly many more than my father ever took of us with his box brownie in the 1950s, that really inform all the books about Anne Frank, all the exhibitions like your own exhibitions, and of course, the uh, displays in the Anne Frank house. Um, and it's a remarkable collection of photographs. Now, growing up in Amsterdam, um, Anne and Margot had a lovely life. Uh, in the summer, the family would take a train 30 minutes out of Amsterdam to Zandvoort on the, on the coast of the North Sea. And uh, you can see the two girls in their lovely matching outfits, looking very modern, actually. And again, I find this photo rather poignant because there are the two girls looking out to the sea. And I think of it as thinking about their future lives. And there, of course, is Anne just about to uh, have a dip in the sea. Uh, in the winter, they would go skating on the frozen canals of Amsterdam, and they even would actually have holidays um, abroad in the summer. They would go and visit their family in Switzerland, and together they would go up in the mountains and have a lovely holiday. Margot, as well as being a very academic and intellectual girl, she was very sporty. And uh, she loved um, rowing. She was a member of a rowing club. She was a member of a tennis club. And of course, a bit later on, of course, she had to leave all those. Now, on the 12th of June, 1939, you can do your arithmetic, and celebrated her 10th birthday with her friends. Um, of course, this wasn't a color photo at the time. I found it hand colored on the internet. And I think it's very beautiful because it really brings those girls to life and their lovely party dresses. So you can probably recognize Anne in the bright green dress. And on the far left is her good friend, Jacqueline Van Marsen. Now, Jacqueline Van Marsen still lives in Amsterdam. She's still alive, direct contemporary of Anne. Um, I've had the privilege of meeting her several times. Uh, on the right of Anne, you can see, you probably recognize her little friend, Susanna Lederman, we saw in the previous pictures. Uh, tragically, Susanna and her family were deported to Auschwitz in 1943, and uh, little Susanna was gassed in Auschwitz. The slightly taller girl next to Susanna is Hannah Pick Gosler. And uh, you may have even had her to visit in South Africa, but again, she's still alive and uh, she's lived, she lives in Jerusalem. The five girls on the left are Anne's non-Jewish friends uh, and had a wide circle of friends at that time. And interestingly, the tall girl in the center of the photograph, by the time the photo was taken, her father had just joined the Dutch Nazi party. Now, just 11 months after this lovely photograph was taken, the unthinkable happens. Uh, on the 10th of May, 1940, Germany bombs the very strategic Dutch port of Rotterdam. After five days, 
the whole city is flattened. If you visit Rotterdam now, you'll find a city that's very different in feel to Amsterdam with its beautiful old 17th century uh, center. Uh, Rotterdam is essentially a modern city because it was rebuilt completely after the war. So after five days of this intensive bombing, the Dutch capitulate, the government and the royal family led by Queen Wilhelmina uh, flee to London. Germany then invades the Netherlands. Um, for a little while, things are quiet, but soon measures are starting against the Jews. Um, in 1942, when Anne is writing in her diary, she describes what it was like for the Jews as the Germans are introducing the measures. She writes, after May 1940, the good times were few and far between. Our freedom was severely restricted by a series of anti-Jewish decrees. We were required to wear the yellow star to turn in our bicycles, we were forbidden to ride on trams, forbidden to go to theatres, cinemas or other forms of entertainment. Swimming pools, tennis courts or other athletic fields. You couldn't do this and you couldn't do that, but life went on. So you can imagine a little girl like Anne who really enjoyed her friends, who enjoyed uh, going to the cinema, going to see a movie or all the activities that had been open to her. She's finding the restrictions increasingly very hard. Now, in 1941, due to the restrictive measures, Anne and Margot have to leave their Montessori school and they have to attend the Jewish only school, the Jewish Lyceum. And in that year too, Mr. Frank has to hand his business over to his non-Jewish employees, Johannes Kleiman his, and Victor Kugler, his two very trusted managers. Thank goodness he had those two. He also had Jan Gies, who we'll hear a little bit more about later, um, who took over the business, uh, who gave the business his name. Of course, Mr. Frank had to look as though he was moving away from the business, but of course he kept a benign eye on what was going on with the business. Now, um, in February 1942, Anne turns 16 and the German occupiers make an announcement that they will issue a decree that all young Jews aged between 16 and 40 will be forced to report for work camps in the East in Germany. Now, very few of those young people who reported for those work camps ever returned. And so you can imagine Mr. and Mrs. Frank are in getting increasingly worried about their old daughter. Now, in this photograph, you can see a picture of the centre of Amsterdam. You might recognise the, the church, the big church, the Vesterkirk. And the building that's highlighted in blue is actually Mr. Frank's warehouse and offices on the Prinsenkracht. And you can see how um, central that is to uh, the city of Amsterdam. Now, normally I explain to audiences what Prinsenkracht means, but I, I imagine that I won't have to necessarily do that for South Africans. Um, of course, it's Prince's Canal. Now, at the back and top of that building, you can see where the sort of little gabled roof is, was a set of rooms that the staff didn't really know existed. And it was actually Victor Kugler, uh, one of Mr. Frank's managers, that reminded Mr. Frank that those rooms were there and they could, if necessary, make an ideal hiding place if the Franks needed to go into hiding very quickly. So over the next few months, um, the uh, Mr. Frank, aided by Mr. Kugler, Mr. Kleiman, uh, start preparing these rooms, this set of rooms at the top and back of the building for possible hiding. Now, not quite as easy as it may sound, because of course, at first they had to do it in under cover of darkness, so they wouldn't raise suspicion. And a building, those old buildings in Amsterdam, they are notoriously steep and narrow. And it's quite a business to schlap big objects up those steep narrow steps. In fact, if you look at the buildings in Amsterdam, if you look up, you will see on there's always a hook. And those hooks at the top of the buildings are really for hoisting up large furniture and objects so you don't have to get them up the stairs. But this had to be done very, very secretly. So there's no way they could hoist the furniture up. Um, now, 
the father of one of the staff members, Bet Voskill, Mr. Frank's secretary, he was a carpenter. And again, Victor Kugler had the idea of creating um, a wooden bookcase so that it could actually conceal the door to the secret annex so the staff wouldn't suspect anything that there was a door just in case anyone got a bit nosy and wondered what was behind the door and so the bookcase was filled with normal office paraphernalia of files and folders and as most of you have visited the Anne Frank house you will know that even to this day you access the secret annex through that very same bookcase. Now, the 12th of June, 1942, Anne celebrates her 13th birthday. And a few days before the birthday, she happens to be walking in the neighborhood with her father. And in the window of the local bookstore, I remember I mentioned it before in relation to the, the statue. Of course, in those days, it was different ownership, but it's still a bookstore in exactly the same place. She spots this in the front window, a little red checked fabric covered notebook. Her eyes prick up because probably what attracted her to this was this a brass lock. And what 13 year old girl that's going to write her most intimate thoughts uh, isn't doesn't want a lock to uh, keep it from prying eyes. So she drops a few hints to her dad, um, like our kids do when it's coming up to their birthdays. And um, he goes back and buys the book and presents it wrapped uh, with Mrs. Frank to Anne as one of her birthday gifts. And uh, she starts writing uh, straight away. Uh, it soon becomes known as her diary. And within about a week, she's actually given it a name. She calls it Kitty, um, after a character in one of her favorite novels. And she says, this is going to become her real true friend, which is quite an admission from a girl that says she has dozens of good friends and quite a few boy admirers that can't keep their eyes off her. Just three weeks after she starts writing in her diary, um, what was absolutely dreaded happens. And on the 5th of the July, 5th of July, a Sunday morning, uh, there is a ring of the doorbell of the Frank family's Mavedaplane uh, Plain apartment. It's a postman delivering the dreaded call up notice for Margot. Margot must report at midnight with her case suitcase packed for deportation. There is absolutely no time to lose. The very next day, the 6th of July 1942, the family flee into hiding. They walk across Amsterdam. In the, fortunately, it was raining, so no one really took much notice of them because they were all trying to shelter from the rain and arrive at the uh, building on the Prinsengracht, Mr. Frank's offices, before the workers arrive for work. And they go up the stairs behind the bookcase and they go into hiding. Um, a few days after they arrive in the hiding place, Anne writes, I don't think I'll ever feel at home in this, this house, but it doesn't mean I hate it. The annex is an ideal place to hide in. It may be damp and lopsided, but there's probably not a more comfortable hiding place in the whole of Amsterdam. I have to tell you, she didn't feel so warmly about the hiding place after a few months. Uh, a week later, the Frank family are joined by another family, that of Mr. Frank's business associate, uh, Herman Van Pels. Remember I told you he went into business with a man who uh, was importing spices for sausages. Uh, Herman's wife, August Van Pels, and their 16-year-old son, Peter Van Pels. At first, Peter and Margot form a little bond because they're the same age, they're 16, and Anne finds them quite tedious and quite boring. Um, later on that year, in December, they're joined by another person. That is a local dentist called Fritz Pfeffer. And unfortunately, at that stage, Margot, who's been sharing this little bedroom with Anne, has to move in with um, Mr. and Mrs. Frank because there simply is no more space. And Anne is forced to share her bedroom with the very annoying Fritz Pfeffer. Now, if you read Anne's diary, you get a picture of Fritz Pfeffer. She calls him, by the way, Mr. Dussel, which means Mr. Stupid in her diary. You get a picture of a man who is um, very, very disciplinarian, uh, very old, very ugly um, and completely stupid. But in fact, Fritz Pfeffer was a very handsome, athletic man of 45. 
Um, but uh, he didn't appeal to Anne whatsoever. She really took it, um, an instant dislike to him. Uh, and perhaps most of all, that she had to share her room and her little writing desk, uh, where she would like to sit and write her diary. But also he snored. So you can imagine to, for a 13 year old girl to be sharing a room with a snoring old man, it wasn't quite the thing. When you visit the Anne Frank house, you will see the originals of these wonderful photographs on the wall, which Mr. Frank brought, brought to the hiding place um, as a surprise for his daughter to make her feel comfortable and a little bit at home because Anne loved movie stars. She loved movie stars, Hollywood, and she also loved the Dutch royal family and also the British royal family. Now, many years ago, I was taking um, the Queen's, our Queen, the British Queen's youngest son, Prince Edward, the Earl of Wessex, around the Anne Frank exhibition. And there was a photograph of Anne's bedroom wall. And I said to him, um, is there anyone in this picture you recognize, sir? And he sort of looked and he peered and he sort of went, oh, oh my goodness, there's my mother. And if you look carefully uh, on the left hand side at the bottom, you will see two little pictures, two little pictures, one above the other of Princess Elizabeth, our, our present queen, and her younger sister, Princess Margaret. And so Prince Edward was able to recognize his mum on uh, Anne Frank's bedroom wall. Now, of course, Anne had her diary with her and uh, she set about recording all aspects of her life in hiding over the course of the next two years how it felt to be isolated from her friends, which has been very relevant to uh, kids and young people over the past year, and not being able to go to school, being homeschooled, if you like, by Mr. Frank. What went on in the secret annex every day and how annoying those adults were in hiding and her fears about what was happening in the outside world. Um, she wrote about her dreams of growing up, imagining her future life when the war was over and her ambition to be a writer. She also wrote stories, fictional stories, as well as her diary. And she let her imagination just fly out of the window of the walls of the hiding place. In April, 1944, she wrote, when I write, I can shake off all my cares. My sorrow disappears. My spirits are revived. Now, of course, Anne was transitioning during those years from a girl, a child, into an adolescent with all that comes with it. So she was experiencing bodily changes and of course emotional changes and feeling romantic feelings. Well, they had to be targeted at the only boy she had access to and that was Peter Van Pels. And in her diary in early 1944, she writes vividly of those feelings and what it felt like to be a teenager falling in love. But after several weeks of this glorious teenage romance, she feels she's outgrown Peter. She finds him rather tedious and she fell out of love again. Um, in April 1944, she discovered a new passion. It was the Dutch education minister, Gerrit Bolkestein, who was in exile in London, who announced on the BBC radio, and by the way, the, the Franks had a, a secret radio in hiding that they would listen to at, in the evenings when the staff had gone home. Um, he announced that the Dutch under the German occupation should consider keeping journals and recording their lives. So Anne had a new project. She started to edit everything she'd written before and continue simultaneously to write her diary, but this time with a view to its possible publication after the war. This was a really exciting project for her. And um, the red check notebook, of course, has soon been used up and she's writing in exercise books and using other bits of paper. And over those coming months of the spring and summer of 1944, Anne described how she felt the world should be, with people behaving better towards each other, how she battled with the two sides of her teenage personality, one which was very flippant and comical and the other deeper Anne. And at age 15, as she was moving towards adulthood, Anne was developing a real moral framework. 
Now, another thing as well as writing that she derived much comfort for in hiding was nature. And she readily admits that on the outside world before hiding, she really hadn't appreciated nature. She writes a lot about nature in her diary and the top of the chestnut tree in the garden, which was really her only window on the outside world. And it was only, she could only see it from a little window, small window at the top of the dusty old attic above the secret hiding place where she would go with Peter Van Pels so they could have some time alone. And she could see the seasons changing through the leaves of that tree. And she writes, it's not my imagination when I look at the sky, the clouds, the moon and the stars, it really does make me feel calm and hopeful. Now, of course, eight people could not be in hiding for not just a few weeks or months, but two years without incredible support. And it's down to these people photographed with Mr. Frank after the war, because, of course, they went back into the business after the war. Now, these are the helpers that risked their lives day after day to help the Jews in hiding, knowing the consequences if they were found out. So on the bottom left, next to Mr. Frank, is probably the best known of the hiders. Uh, that's Mipis. And on the right is Bette Voskill, who was actually quite young. She was the secretary and she was around just a little bit older than Margot. So they formed a bit of a friendship. At the back, you've got Johannes Kleiman and Victor Kugler, the two trusted managers. And um, I am absolutely in awe of these people because not only under rationing in war did they have to feed their own families, they were responsible for feeding eight, fam eight people. And Meep and Jan, her husband, were actually harboring a young Dutch boy in their own home who had refused to join the, the Nazi party as well. So they were risking their lives day after day. Now, I was very fortunate um, uh, in the uh, 1990s and early 2000s to actually spend quite a bit of time with Meep, even visiting her in her own apartment in Amsterdam. Uh, she was absolutely a remarkable woman. And, um, and still felt almost a guilt that she wasn't able to save the lives of the Frank family and their friends. Um, she was a wonderful educator as well. And um, I spent a wonderful evening in um, March 1996, walking the red carpet of the Academy Awards, the, the Oscars in Hollywood with me. Um, when a documentary that um, I had commissioned John Blair, the amazing documentary maker, to make, and really Meep was the star of the, the documentary, uh, actually received an Academy Award. And when John went up on the stage in Hollywood that evening, in front of a billion people watching worldwide, he introduced a sort of white-haired elderly lady, very different from some of the glamorous uh, Hollywood actresses that, that people expected to see on the stage. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, in a city of celluloid heroes, please meet a real one. And you can imagine the whole auditorium erupted when they realized this was the helper of Anne Frank. On the 6th of June, 1944, we've just marked that anniversary two days ago, the British, American and Canadian troops uh, landed in France to liberate Europe from the Nazis. Anne is writing voraciously that day in her diary. She's so excited. She feels that friends are heading on their way to liberate them. And soon she'll be able to come out of hiding. And maybe, just maybe by October, she'll be able to go back to school. So you can imagine after June the 6th, through June, through July, hopes are really rising, hopes are high in the secret annex that liberation is near at hand. The 4th of August 1944, it's a bright sunny day in Amsterdam. At around 10 o'clock in the morning, someone, and we will never know who, makes a call to the Gestapo in Amsterdam and reports that there are Jews hiding at 263 Prinsengracht. About half an hour later, a car draws up and uh, a, a, an Austrian Gestapo officer, Karl Josef Silberbauer, accompanied by a couple of Dutch policemen, uh, march into the offices and go up the stairs. There they find Mr. Um, 
uh, Mr. Kugler and Mr. Kleiman, and pointing pistols, they uh, look around and then they point to the bookcase. They ask Mr. Kugler and Mr. Kleiman to open the bookcase and then they tell them to go up the stairs, the door of the door. And there they find eight terrified Jews. The eight terrified Jews are taken away. They are taken at first to the Gestapo headquarters in southern Amsterdam, where they're interrogated for two days. They are then put on a train to Vesterbork camp in the north of the Netherlands. On the 3rd of September, all eight Jews are deported from the Netherlands to Auschwitz in Poland. Now, um, had the Frank family and their friends been discovered, perhaps uh, a few weeks later, they may not have been on the, deported to uh, Poland because they were actually on the very last transport out of the Netherlands to Auschwitz. They arrived there after a horrific journey three days later, and on the platform of Auschwitz, the women are separated from the men and they never see them again. Uh, late in October, Anne and Margot are separated from their mother, their desperate mother, Edith, and they are transported back to Germany, the country of their birth, to Bergen-Belsen camp. It's very difficult to survive Bergen-Belsen in that last winter of the war. The water is contaminated, there is very little food. I've met many survivors of Bergen-Belsen who told me they don't even remember seeing food. Um, somehow they survived. And uh, waves of the deadly disease of typhus are going through the camp. And when you have no nourishment and you're very weak, it's very, very difficult to survive typhus. Now, sometime in the spring, either February or March of 1945, Margot and then a day or so later, Anne, cannot go on and both die within about a day of each other. Uh, Tragically, had they known that uh, liberation was so close, only a few weeks away, the liberation of Bergen-Belsen by the British, perhaps they would have had the strength to carry on. Or had they known that their father had actually been liberated by then from Auschwitz and was already on his journey back to Amsterdam, it may just have given them the uh, boost in morale to carry on, but it didn't and they were buried, the two little emaciated bod bodies were thrown into a mass pit in Bergen-Belsen. Of course, there was no gravestone at the time. This was put up a few years ago by uh, Anne and Margot's cousin in Switzerland, Buddy Elias, who sadly has also passed on now. It takes five months for Otto to arrive back in Amsterdam. It's a torturous journey across uh, Europe, because of course Western Europe, when he was liberated by the Russians from Auschwitz, Western Europe was still at war. So he doesn't arrive back in Amsterdam until June of that year. He's got nowhere to live because uh, uh, after they have fled from the Maveda Plain apartment, it's been given to requisitioned and given to Nazi sympathizing Dutch people. Uh, so he goes to live with Meep and her husband Jan and tries desperately to find out what has happened to his two daughters. Uh, he asks around and uh, even puts an advertisement in the local newspaper. And eventually one day he's working in the office and a telegram arrives from the Red Cross, giving him that terrible, terrible news that the, his girls are no more. He comes out of his office and goes to see Meep, who's sitting at her desk and says to him, says to her, the ashen-faced Meep, the girls are no more. And with that, Meep goes to the door, drawer of her desk, and she pulls out the little red check diary. Here you are, Mr. Frank, she says. Here is the testament of your daughter. Meep has bravely rescued Anne's diary and all her papers from the floor when uh, the uh, officers had arrested the family in the hope that she could give Anne's precious diary back to her because the Allies were advancing and hopefully the family would soon come back to Amsterdam. She doesn't read the diary because she knew it was a secret diary and she puts it in her drawer to give to Anne on her return. 
Otto goes away and reads the diary. He realizes he never really knew the hidden depths of his daughter, who was often very flippant, very facetious, and a very precocious girl, who meant the adults in hiding often thought of as very self-centered. But he realizes that here was a girl with a great moral framework. Now, it presents him with a great dilemma because um, on the one hand, he knew that his daughter's greatest wish was to have been a published writer. But on the other hand, uh, she didn't speak very kindly of her mother, her sister, and the others who had been murdered so brutally that were all in hiding together. So he uh, consults a few friends whose advice he respects, including uh, a literary critic friend called Jan Romain. Would you publish this diary or try to have it published? And Jan Romain is, is smitten with the diary and actually writes an article which is published on the front page of the Hepperol newspaper, uh, saying that everybody should read this girl's diary. And on the strength of that, a publishing company comes forward called Contact. It's a small Catholic publishing company, and they agree to publish the diary in a limited run of 1500 copies, just to test the water, um, to see how uh, the Dutch uh, receive it. Because of course the Dutch, they'd suffered so much, particularly in that last year of the war, the winter of hunger, and they really wanted to move on with their lives rather than looking back and reading testimonies of the war. And so on the 25th of June, 1947, Anne's diary is published as a book. It's called Het Acht de Hus. I hope my pronunciation is correct, uh, meaning the back house. And um, uh, actually they published two thirds of what we read in the diary today for several reasons. First of all, Mr. Frank did actually remove some of the more critical passages Anne wrote about her mother. And secondly, the publishing company didn't deem some of what Anne wrote about when she was having her romance with Peter uh, suitable reading for those years. Now, um, by December of that year, uh, it's gone into its second edition. By February the following year, there's a third edition published. And as they say, the rest is history. Now, in one of her first entries, Anne wrote, writing in a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me, not only because I've never written anything before, but also it seems to me that later on, neither I nor anyone else would be interested in the musings of a 13-year-old schoolgirl. Not interested? Well, to date, Anne's diary has sold more than 30 million copies. I used to actually say that it was probably the most widely read book in the English language, um, but that was before, after the Bible, of course, uh, but that was before Harry Potter came along. It's been translated into more than 70 languages. I was walking through a Bangkok airport a few years ago and I actually saw a copy in the Thai language in the airport bookstore. And I gave a talk last summer and someone take, sent me a beautiful photograph of a copy in an Ethiopian dialect that they'd seen on a market stall in Addis Ababa. And every year there are new and dramatic musical interpretations, documentaries and books about Anne's life continuing to be created. And the travelling exhibition about her life, which we're going to hear a little bit more about in a minute, has been seen by nine million people around the world. And it may even be another million since uh, we knew that figure. Now, in the 1950s, a strange phenomenon starts happening. Now, in 1953, Mr. Frank remarries another Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz called Fritzi Geringer, who has lost her husband and also her teenage son, Heinz. And I think you know quite a bit about Fritzi Geringer um, because of uh, Eva, Eva Schloss's visit, um, Fritzi's daughter to South Africa, and uh, the wonderful exhibit that you've shown, uh, The Promise, about her story. But Otto starts receiving letters from teenagers all over the world. Now, remember that in the 1950s, 60s, and maybe the 70s too, um, teenagers were not considered young adults. They're 
like they are now, of course, they were still considered children and they felt that they couldn't really open up and talk candidly uh, about their concerns and problems to their parents or their teachers. Now, because Anne had given such a wonderful description of her father, who she described as Pim, her little pet name in her diary, as a liberal minded uh, man that she could talk to openly, um, he was the one adult in the hiding place that she did speak warmly of. Um, they started writing letters to Mr. Frank. Now, remember, in those days, uh, we didn't have word processors. Every single letter that Mr. Frank received from anyone in the world, helped by Fritzy, he answered on an old typewriter. That's quite a feat. And a couple of years ago, I was giving a talk in a New York library and a lady came up to me afterwards and said, Julian, I've got something to show you. And um, she, as a teenager in the 1970s, had herself written to Mr. Frank and was shocked to receive a reply from him. And as a well brought up young girl, she actually wrote to thank him. And he wrote back to thank her for her thank you letter. And she had with her these two wonderful letters from Mr. Frank that she showed me, and she, she got me copies of them as well, which I left with the Anne Frank Center in New York. Now, during the 1950s, there is a play produced on Broadway. There is a movie produced in 1959. And the hiding place itself, because the diary is being published around the world, uh, is becoming a place of pilgrimage and people would stand across the canal and look at the very building where Anne had been hiding. In 1960, there were plans by Amsterdam City Council to knock that whole area down. It was becoming pretty derelict. And in the 1960s, uh, city councils did knock these old buildings down. They didn't see the value of historic buildings like they do today. Now, Mr. Frank went with a group of friends to see the mayor of Amsterdam and prevailed upon him that the building should be preserved and turned into a museum. But Mr. Frank's vision was not for a backward looking memorial museum. This was going to be an education center. So he very much visualized, if you like, what the South Af Africa Holocaust and Genocide Foundation had in their minds too. A center of learning, a center of education, where young people would come together from different backgrounds, from different countries, and would break down those barriers of misunderstanding, suspicion, and mistrust. And there you see Mr. Frank, on the opening day up in that dusty old attic where Peter and Anne used to go to be together. You can only imagine what must be going on in this man's minds. Um, he started holding student conferences and um, bringing young people together from all over Europe. Of course, in those days, we didn't fly from South Africa or from America. Um, <clears throat> but can you believe just 15 years after this man was liberated from Auschwitz, some of the first students he invited to those conferences were young people from Germany, West Germany at the time. He so believed in the power of education to break down those barriers of suspicion and that so he hoped that young people would not have to suffer like his own two beautiful daughters had. Um, now here is a particular admirer of Anne Frank and of her father. You might recognize her. Uh, the lady in the middle is none other than Audrey Hepburn. And there she is in Switzerland uh, in 1950, in late 1950s, 1958, I think, with Otto and Fritzi Frank. And they had gone to prevail upon her to play Anne in the forthcoming movie. Uh, Eva Schloss and I had the privilege of meeting Audrey Hepburn. Jan Eric was with us as well uh, in 1991 in London. She was performing at the Barbican. And she told us that the reason that she couldn't play Anne Frank in the movie, apart from the fact that she might have been a little bit old at the time, was because when she read Anne's diary, it literally broke her heart. She felt such an affinity with Anne. 
Um, Audrey, of course, wasn't Jewish. She wasn't uh, a, a victim of the Holocaust, but uh, her mother had been in the Dutch resistance. They lived in Arnhem. And Audrey herself, as a teenager, exact contemporary of Anne, they were born in the same year, had been running errands for the Dutch resistance, so, uh, actually hiding messages for the resistance in her school shoes. And when she read Anne's diary, it just broke her heart because she could see the resonances of, of her own teenage years and Anne's. So there you are, there's Audrey Hepburn. I'm thrilled to say that she actually became one of the very first patrons of the Anne Frank Educational Trust. Um, but sadly, she died very soon after in 1993. Um, now, believe it or not, when you first visited the Anne Frank house in the early 60s, you had to ring the doorbell and wait for someone to let you in. But by the mid 1980s, the queues of people waiting to get in were building up. This picture was actually much more contemporary uh, and pre-pandemic, I have to say, and also pre the new booking system at the Anne Frank house. A little word of warning, if you are planning to visit the house, um, you must um, book your tickets online, um, preferably uh, six weeks before your visit. If you book them too early, they won't be released yet. If you book them too late, they will all have gone. So you don't see those lines of people anymore. And of course, now not with social distancing. I know the Anne Frank House has recently uh, reopened. But by the mid 1980s, the queues are starting to build up. And one day, a member of the Anne Frank House staff is looking out the window and at the queues, and uh, he suddenly gets an idea and goes to visit, see the director. And he says to Hans Wester, the director, how about if we create a traveling version of the Anne Frank House for people who can't get to visit us in person? And so the very first Anne Frank exhibition, Anne Frank in the World, 1929 to 1949, 1945, was created by historians, including Dinka Hondius, at the Anne Frank House. Um, as you can see, it was met very monochrome at, in those days. Um, black and white photos because we didn't have some of the astonishing colour photographs that uh, started arriving from Eastern Europe when the Soviet bloc opened up in early 1990s. Black and white photos, white PVC screens and uh, grey coloured aluminium frames. Now I have to tell you this exhibition was hugely successful and you know from South Africa how successful it was in the early 1990s. But um, as a sort of um, a, a, a small person, uh, I found it quite challenging because it was designed by Dutch people. And the Dutch are um, the tallest nation in the world. So some of the photographs were really high up and um, some of the school kids, but, and particularly myself, found themselves looking like that to see the photos and read the captions. But nonetheless, it was a hugely successful exhibition and actually was one of the first cultural projects to go into Moscow in 1990 when uh, the Soviet bloc started falling apart and Moscow was becoming more liberal. And it had an incredible impression on the Muscovites carried on touring thanks to Jan Eric and his team around the former Soviet countries. And there we are in 1994, it um, comes to South Africa. And I had the great privilege, as Myra's mentioned, of coming to open the um, exhibition in Port Elizabeth. I have to say the timing was in immaculate because um, my husband Tony and I fetched up in Johannesburg five days before the inauguration and found ourselves staying in the same hotel as 49 heads of state who were attending the inauguration. Um, and then uh, I had been in Port Elizabeth for several days training volunteers. And here you can see some of the incredible team. You can see there's uh, um, Merle, the wonderful Merle Katz, who I can see is on, on the call. Merle standing behind me. Um, and then on the left, we've got Carol Kahn and Melanie Herman from the volunteers team. And um, of course, uh, the indomitable Myra on the right. Uh, so that's where uh, getting ready for the opening in Port Elizabeth. And we had the honor of it being attended by the late Dame Helen Sussman, one of my all time heroes, and uh, the late Governor Becky. And uh, it was quite astonishing to see Mr. and Becky uh, at the Jewish Community Center in Port Elizabeth being entertained. It was just 
a remarkable, remarkable time to be in South Africa. Um, and um, uh, it was actually euphoric actually being there at the time. Sadly, I didn't get to the Johannesburg opening in August 1994. And this was opened by Mr. Mandela. And uh, he astonished the audience when he talked about how he had read Anne's diary as a young man before he went into prison and the effect it had had on him. But actually, he then said that it had been smuggled into the library on Robin Island for the university uh, that he had started on Robin Island to educate the young political prisoners. And uh, the, the copy, the little copy of the diary, the paperback copy was read so much, handed around so much to the prisoners that it literally fell to pieces. And uh, he related how the prisoners took turns to copy it out at night on pieces of paper by candlelight in their prison cells in Robin Island so that it could continue being read by the young prisoners as a testament to the human spirit. And it's a remarkable story that Mr. Mandela told. It was actually told to me personally by Mr. Mbeki actually at the uh, Port Elizabeth opening, but it was Mr. Mandela who reiterated it. And um, what's happened to that little copy that they copied out, we just don't know. But it's, I think it's one of the most remarkable stories of uh, Anne Frank's diary's place in history. Of course, there was a rather fantastic um, legacy of that exhibition, which Myra and Mary have both alluded to. Following the exhibition, um, the South African Holocaust Foundation was set up and uh, first of all, the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center, followed by Durban. And I love this picture of the incredible Memorial Garden in Durban. Um, and then of course, Johannesburg all opened. And so the, test, the, the legacy of the tour of Anne Frank's exhibition is so profound in uh, South, South Africa and really for the continent of Africa. And I know it will continue to be so for many, many years. And, you're all doing pretty incredible work. Now, um, of course, the exhibitions have been touring since 1985, um, but more recently, in the years more recently, it's actually um, the teenagers who've been doing the educating and they're being trained by uh, the Anne Frank House to be peer educators, to be peer guides. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are ready to come on a little whistle stop tour of the world, it'll be a very short one. I'm going to take you around the world with your suitcases out of the um, uh, South African greyness of the winter and take you to some rather um, uh, surprising places around the world. So I'm going to start with uh, this picture and this was taken in Kolkata in India. And here is the Anne Frank exhibition at the school in Kolkata. And you could see the peer educator, the peer guide on the left, talking to teenagers. Teenagers, educating teenagers about a teenager. It really works. And it was actually the Indian children themselves who made the connection between the discrimination that Anne suffered and the ongoing iniquities in the Indian society of the caste system. So by telling Anne's story, you don't have to preach about being nice to others and being equitable to others. The kids get it. They suggest it themselves. Um, this is in Japan. And here we have peer educators. Uh, now it's a dichotomy in Japan because Anne's diary has been popular in Japan since 1952. It was actually one of the very first countries to publish Anne's diary. Um, surprising because of the, they were, of course, in the Axis uh, side in the war. But it's only really recently, in recent years, that the diary, that Anne's diary and Anne's life has been set in context of the Holocaust. Up to then, she was seen as a symbol of peace, a symbol of the suffering of all children in wars, but they didn't contextualize it against what Anne actually suffered. Um, 
so in recent years, the Anne Frank exhibition has been touring, going into schools as a wonderful coordinator who gets into many schools in Japan. Uh, and there's even now a Holocaust museum in Tokyo. Um, our next port of call is uh, the UK, where we've been actually taking Anne's story into prisons uh, since 2002. And it's actually the prisoners themselves who've been the peer educators. Now, we train the prisoners to be exhibition guides. We give them a special T-shirt and we leave that with them. And at the end of their two weeks of uh, doing their guiding, we have a graduation ceremony and we give them a certificate. And in some cases, it's the first time these young people have had a certificate for anything in their lives and being valued. And we truly value them. And um, one of the... Um, important aspects of going into prisons is wherever we can, we take a Holocaust survivor into a prison to speak to prisoners. Now, increasingly, of course, you know, since the pandemic, it's been, we haven't been doing that, but of course our precious treasured survivors are getting fewer and fewer and really too frail to travel around the country visiting prisons. And there you see Eva Schloss, my co-founder of the Trust, who's known to many of you, uh, Otto's uh, stepdaughter, talking to prisoners in a, a prison in West London. And you can see how intently they're listening. You can hear a pin drop when a, an elderly lady or gentleman, smartly dressed, stands in front of prisoners and says, well, actually, I was in prison too, you know, and tells their story of how they were incarcerated simply to be worked to death or immediately killed. And so the Holocaust survivor will implore the prisoners to take every opportunity that's afforded them into in prisons. Learn a, learn a, a new topic, study, take a degree, learn a new career. And believe me, when uh, prisoners hear it coming from a Holocaust survivor, they listen and take notice. And it gives them a whole new sense of perspective about their own grievances against society. Another legacy of the Anne Frank exhibition tour was that um, my colleagues from the Anne Frank house and many of you will recognize uh, the tall gentleman in the back on the right as Aaron Petterer from the Anne Frank house. Um, uh, again, uh, the Anne Frank exhibition has been going directly into schools in particular areas of the townships around Johannesburg and Cape Town. I know Aaron has been working very closely with your organizations. And there um, it is the exhibition in Orlando West outside Joburg. And um, <laughs> I know that um, after the exhibition, there was a writing competition staged by the American Embassy in South Africa. And one of the uh, people on the, on the left-hand side, I'm not quite sure who it is, Aaron will perhaps tell us a little bit later, uh, he entered the competition and wrote about what it meant to him to be an Anne Frank peer educator in his school. And guess what? He won the competition. He was flown across to Washington, D.C., where he was treated as a real VIP. He came back to South Africa. He studied. He went to university. And that young man is now a teacher. All because he wrote about what it meant to him to be an Anne Frank peer educator. And here we are in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia, the land of uh, Genghis Khan. And you think, what on earth would these young people feel they have in common with a little Jewish girl from Western Europe who lived in the middle of the last century? But you can see how intently these young people are listening to the peer educator in Kazakhstan. So Anne Frank has a message uh, and a relevance to teenagers wherever they are. In the 1990s and early 2000s, I did a lot of work in Northern Ireland um, where the communities are still very divided. Um, they're still very sectarian. You live, go to school, go shopping in a Protestant area or a Catholic area and very little opportunity for young people to get together. But in actual fact, um, we always ensured that young people came together at the Anne Frank exhibition and learned about Anne Frank's story and what she suffered through prejudice and discrimination. And um, in Armagh in 1999, uh, one of my proudest moments of the Trust was when young people from a Catholic and a Protestant school came together to produce a cross community newspaper called Anne's Legacy. And here we are in uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. 
and um, you can see the here the uh, little guides in a school in a favela like a shanty town but a, called a favela in a very poor area they're as young as 11 and you can see how enthusiastically they're showing round the gentleman in the red tie and explaining to him what happened in Europe after the First World War that led to the Nazi party coming into power and the Holocaust that affected Anne Frank. Uh, the man in the red tie, as you can see, is listening so intently to what these young people are telling him. But it didn't seem to worry the young people at all that the man who they were telling about the history of Europe was none other than the Dutch foreign minister who was on a state visit to Sao Paulo. Uh, here we are in a um, very multicultural school in London uh, with our peer educators. And my final picture from around the world, from our little tour, is in Sri Lanka. And this is in Jaffna, which uh, for 30 years there was a terrible, brutal civil war going on in uh, Sri Lanka. And um, this is one of the very first projects that got up to Jaffna in the north of the country that was out of bounds for many, many years during that civil war. And here you see our, our, our peer educator in her lovely purple sari. And there are young people there from both sides in the former conflict, from the Lankan and the Tamil sides coming together. And these young people decided because of the Anne Frank exhibition, they were going to create their own traveling exhibition together, explaining what had gone on in the Civil War. So there she is, um, Anne Frank, a teenager, in some ways an ordinary teenager, but in some ways an extraordinary teenager. But she had to die because she was considered different, simply because she was Jewish. And in the Nazi racist ideology, she was untermenschen, subhuman, not worthy of the right to live. Um, but wouldn't the world be a pretty boring place if we were all exactly the same? And finally, I'm just going to end with Anne's words. And she wrote this on the 15th of July, 1944. It's utterly impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering and death. I see the world being slowly transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder that one day will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. And yet when I look up at the sky, I somehow feel that everything will change for the better, that this cruelty will end and peace and tranquility will return once more. In the meantime, I must hold on to my ideals. Perhaps the day will come when I'll be able to realize them. Yours, Anne M. Frank. But thanks to thousands of educators, of human rights activists, and most importantly, our young teenage peer educators, those ideals are being realized. And just if a little note, um, my book, uh, The Legacy of Anne Frank, tells you all these stories and many more, including a whole chapter on the work in South Africa and on Meet Peace, Buddy Elias, many of the people that I was privileged to meet who were so close to Anne. And if you order it directly from uh, the publisher, Pen and Sword, um, and use the code Anne Frank, you'll get a 15% discount. So I do hope you get to read it. It's been described as a handbook of hope, and um, I'm looking forward to any questions or observations. Thank you very much. Wow. Wow, Gillian, thank you. Tour de force indeed. And uh, you really brought us into this uh, world, not only of uh, Anne and a family and, and the secret annex, but the lessons and the learning from it. We do not have too much time, but there are wonderful comments and wonderful questions. Maybe I'll actually ask uh, one of the last questions that came from Toby. Do you think Anne's diary would have had such a massive impact on the world had she survived the Second World War? Yeah, Tally, I'm asked that a lot. And of course, my answer is, you know, whatever impact Anne's diary and her words that she wrote had on the world, it would have been far better if that wonderful young girl had 
survived because I do genuinely believe because how she was developing her moral framework she would herself had had some degree of impact on the world and I really I, I'm actually um, working on a, a holocaust resource uh, with Penn State University in America at the moment and they've asked me to do a whole section on survivors because I've been so privileged to meet many survivors over the past 30 years I can see what an impact they have had. And even if for those first years when they were bringing up their families and they wanted to protect their families from the horrors that they'd been through, they sort of locked that door to the cupboard and didn't speak. Once those people started speaking out, um, they have been an, become an incredible source of education. And in the last few years, virtually all the survivors that are um, surviving now have been honoured by the Queen with honours for their work. But also not only that, what they've done in the worlds of, of business and arts and other fields and actually become philanthropists themselves. So I do think um, Anne's diary possibly maybe the diary because it's so poignant the fact that she died as a teenage diary might not have had such an impact but she herself I'm sure would have done Absolutely. working closely with her father yeah yeah and and maybe it's connecting to to Mehek Burza from India joining us uh, uh, writing about about women in the holocaust and she's asking why, you know, there are so many diaries, as you said, may, many memoirs and diaries. What do you think, uh, why Anne Frank's diary became such a huge success? Several reasons. Um, sadly, most of those diaries did not survive. There are, you know, a, a few diaries. Um, and it was a, a real chance that a diary would actually survive after the Holocaust. And with Anne, of course, there was um, a, a continuum of particular events that uh, the fact that Meep rescued it and saved it for Anne, the fact that Otto survived and what he chose to do with the diary. That's why uh, it's, it's had such an impact. Um, and the fact perhaps also that Otto was such a keen photographer and we don't only have the resource of Anne's words and what she was thinking about, but those incredible photographs of her growing up. So she is really a real person to us. And we even have that seven seconds of footage of her that makes her even more real. Um, and we have the memories of people like Eva, people like Jacqueline Van Marsen, people like Hannah Pitt Gosler, and of course her late cousin Buddy Elias, and Meep, of course, that people can actually remember her and describe her. Yes, and um, uh, um, Myra is, is reminding us that uh, Hannah Pitt Gosler not only came once, but came actually twice to South Africa. Uh, Myra reminded us that uh, she came for the opening of the exhibition in Cape Town um, in March 1994 at the South African National Art Gallery. And let me just say that we have with us many of the guides from that exhibition, Mel Katz from Port Elizabeth, yeah. many, many others that I saw uh, here, you know, joining us and remembering all those, uh, all those days. One more comment from uh, Mary Kluck saying, we have a letter of response from Mip Chies to a youngster in Durban, Mark Shotland, mm -hmm. who had written to him many years ago. So you spoke a little bit about Otto. Can you speak a little bit about Mip and her correspondence with, with youngsters yeah. and others? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mip was, again, you see herself, she was a remarkable person. Um, she didn't think that what she did was in any way brave. Um, she, she did what she did because she had huge respect for Mr. Frank. And uh, she couldn't see any other option but to, to look after people that were in such serious danger. Uh, and, you know, I mentioned to you that Jan, her husband, was in the Dutch resistance. They were both harboring a, a young Dutch boy in their own home, which was dangerous enough. And she really devoted so many years as an elderly lady to educating young people. I have a handwritten, you know, hand signed letter from her. Uh, there was a school in London that did a wonderful project on Anne Frank every year. And every year they would have a letter of congratulations from me signed 
Um, <laughs> so um, it was just a great privilege to have spent time with her. I do remember one particular occasion taking her to the BBC to do a radio program. And she was walking around the BBC building, which is a very historic building. It was you know, built in the 1920s. And she was like touching the walls. And I say, what are you doing here? And she said, do you realize this was our lifeline when we were in, uh, in, you know, in, in Amsterdam? This was our line. I can't believe that I'm actually here. And she would describe to me, um, you know, that Anne gave a terrible um, press in her diary to poor Auguste Van Pels, who died a terrible death. Um, and she actually said to me, I mean, this you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. She actually said to me, you know, Julian, she was a very, very sweet lady. And she was actually still wearing a ring that Mrs. Van Pels had given to her. And she used to describe to me how Edith would come, Edith Frank would come downstairs um, to the, you know, as far as the bookcase, but no further, and say to her privately, you know, um, Meep, I'm so worried. I'm so worried about what's going to be happening. I mean, poor Edith was virtually having a nervous breakdown, you know, in hiding. People, you know, she was a young woman herself. She was only in her early 40s trying to protect her daughters. So um, I, I just think it's one of the greatest privileges of my life to have actually spent time with Meep Geese. She was a remarkable woman. And if ever you get an opportunity to see the film, and Frank remembered the documentary that won the Oscar. Please do. It's two hours. Um, you can even get it on DVD. Uh, um, there's uh, Meep is the undoubted star of that of that um, of that documentary. It's amazing. We have with us uh, uh, Maud Dem uh, that is thanking you for for your presentation. Uh, Holocaust survivor herself from the Netherlands that was uh, hidden also by a Righteous Amongst the Nation. So speaking about Meep and, and Bep and the others. And then I see Martin uh, here uh, that is uh, also from the Netherlands and uh, she and her husband are, are working with a wonderful story of uh, Corrie Ten Boom. Oh, yeah. uh, another, uh, of course, a very famous uh, uh, a story of bravery and courage. Mm -hmm. so, so that is amazing uh, to have them with us. Robin is asking, did Meep have her own children? And what does the family of Meep and the other, uh, those that were recognized as righteous amongst the na nations, think about their you know, families uh, today? Uh, yes, Meep, Meep, Meep had a son. Meep and Jan had a son not long after the end of the war. And there is actually a photo, nice photographs of, of Meep and her husband and Otto Frank with, with the son. Uh, his, I believe his name was Paul. Um, and of course, he's lived with his parents' legacy all his life. Um, yes, uh, Bep, um, I'm in Facebook contact with her son, actually. Uh, Yoop, and he's recently published a wonderful book about his mother um, and given her, you know, due um, acknowledgement for the bravery that she, she did herself. Um, uh, and, and in terms of um, Mr. Kleiman and Mr. Kugler, uh, Mr. Kleiman suffered terribly during the hiding. Uh, um, it caused an enormous amount of stress, which, which impacted on his health. And um, after the families were arrested, uh, Kleiman and Kugler were both arrested too and uh, Mr. Kleiman was actually, uh, he was uh, in a prison hospital and visited by the Red Cross who insisted that he was released because he was in such poor health and Victor Kugler actually managed to escape uh, when he was being transferred from one prison to another. It just had coincided with an Allied bombing raid and he took the opportunity to escape and he hid for the rest of the uh, war until liberation for several weeks. Um, so you can imagine they all actually uh, were under incredible stress in their own way. And, um, and I, I don't know if Mr. Klein and Mr. Kugler had children. I, I can't remember. But I think Mr. Kugler had a stepchild because he, ma he uh, married, divorced and then remarried. Um, but actually, interesting story. I was giving a, a talk several years ago, actually, at a big education conference. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, I'm from Toronto in Canada. And um, I knew a man called Vic Kugler, who was a member of my photography club. And it turns out uh, it was later discovered that this was, in fact, the same Victor Kugler. But he said uh, he was so modest 
he never actually explained that he was the Victor Kugler that had hidden the Frank family. Um, so, you know, they all had their own stories. Absolutely. And, and, and it's interesting how many times you hear this humble, you know, uh, description of those yeah. that just did what, what they could have done. Uh, there are lots of uh, comments thanking you, lots of people recommending books. Uh, G. Holm is, is um, mentioning, of course, the excellent book about teenage diaries, uh, Salvage Pages by Alexandra uh, as the Bruder. Um, he earlier um, asked a, a, an interesting question or commented, and, and, and Juliana, wonder what you think about the Amer Americanization of the diary, the Americanization of the theater piece and the film of the Anne Frank diary. Well, if you're referring to the George Stevens movie of 1959, it was of its time. Um, and of course, uh, it, it was based on the play that um, Otto and Fritzi Frank approved. Um, they actually moved away from an earlier version written by Maya Levin, which was too uh, judified. Uh, that's another story. It was of its time. Um, Personally, I find it very Americanized and sentimentalized. Um, I've actually seen other productions of the play in America. Um, I've seen uh, it produced in very a very large theater in Broadway, where I, uh, of course, the actors were having to shout um, from the stage and I kept saying, be quiet, <laughs> just be quiet, they'll find you. Um, it was kind of inappropriate, um, but, uh, those original versions, the 1950s versions, were very much of, of the time. And Mr. Frank felt very genu genuinely that if it was a sort of very Jewish story, and remember in those days, people weren't so interested in other cultures as we are now, um, that no one would bother to go and see it unless they happen to be a Jewish New York audience. And so that's why he, he actually preferred uh, to go with the more universalized uh, version of the play and subsequently the film. And of course, since then, subsequently, there's been another version of the play written by Wendy Kesselman, which brings Anne's Jewishness back. And there have been other dramatizations of the story, notably the BBC production in 2009, The Diary of Anne Frank, which is extremely good and I would highly recommend. Yeah, and even in Netflix, I think last year there was um, a, a new version. So, so it continues. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But but we make them now contemporized, and we make them relevant to our times. Absolutely. I, I know the time is, is really, we are so, so running out of time, but maybe, you know, the question of questions of who betrayed, you know, uh, the, the, the eight um, in, uh, in, uh, in the annex. And Mary is saying there are rumors that MIP knew the identity of the person who betrayed the families. And Mehek uh, actually asked, was it is it true that the identity is uh, known now? And you mentioned... Well, it, it, there is one theory that, um, and it's alluded to in, in Yup um, Voskil's book, um, and I, I believe that probably carries a lot more weight than any of the others, um, and it concerns a member of his own family. Um, but, and I know that it's being, there's a documentary being made in the Netherlands, um, which was postponed due to the pandemic. Hopefully we'll get to see it this year or next year, uh, where they brought in a retired FBI agent to use modern technology to try and figure it out. All I know is that we will never know the absolute truth because no one is around that can verify any of these facts. It will remain speculation. And that's all I can say. But I do believe the, the latest theory probably carries more weight than others. We can speak to you for hours. Julian. I'll come back that next is, week. <laughs> <laughs> that is the reality. But, I'll carry uh, on talking to Mary next week when I see her. Exactly. We're looking so, forward to But there's to lots that. more stories in there. Thank you. So I recommend very much for everyone to, to read the book. And before I let uh, Mary uh, just say the, 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 the last word, just to say, 
wonderful to work with my colleagues from the Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg Lovely. Holocaust and Genocide Centers with Myra Osrin, with the survivors that are here with us. Amazing to have uh, the survivors with us. And of course, the people from the Anne Frank House, Jan Eric Dubelman, uh, Aaron Petere, old friends. Yeah, Absolutely very... wonderful to have all of you. I see such good friends. Bill, I didn't see you for ages and many, many others. So it's just wonderful, Gillian, that you brought everyone together to listen to you and to learn from you. Well, that, that was you guys, Tally, Tally and, and Mary and Heba, and of course our wonderful Myra. Um, and what a legacy you have created. So, and I want to wave goodbye to Merle and Arnie. <laughs> So lovely to see you. And it, uh, Claudia, if I could just have a copy of the chat, that would be just lovely for me to see all the questions and all the comments. That's oh, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Gillian. And thank you to the teams, as Tully said, for all their hard work in making sure that this was just a seamless, beautiful evening. We've so thoroughly enjoyed it. Who would believe that we aren't all in the same room? It mm. feels like we're all tightly, closely connected. And that's the silver lining, as we always say, of social media and yes. this opportunity of, to have Gillian with us and another time. We look forward to it again, Gillian. And uh, thank you so much to you for your gracious, wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you to all of you for your questions. Look forward to seeing you at our webinars in the coming weeks. Um, until then, stay safe. I know in South Africa, the COVID wave is beginning again. Please look after yourselves and thank you so much for being with us. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.